Greetings, dear friends. It's good to be with you once again in our Monday night open forum. And we trust that you were with us for the last Monday night open forum as well. We were talking about things relating, well, things that very much relate to our salvation. We were talking about what you have heard called, I'm sure, the second advent of Christ. And in fact, we would like to talk about that today as well, emphasizing the second. And in a, in a biblical way, looking at what the Bible calls the first and the second. The first and the second. There are words that relate to the first as the old uh, in the Scripture and that relate to the second as the new in the Scripture. There's also two terms used throughout the Scripture and particularly in, in the New Testament where all of this begins to come together in the person of Christ. And those two terms are flesh and spirit. And there, we, there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding with regard to those two terms, just like there is with regard to the first and second. Uh, in much of the church world today, and it has been that way for, uh, I don't know, at least 200 years, uh, and maybe more so even in the last 100 years, uh, but the history of it is not that important, uh, where the terminology of, of the first and the second uh, has pretty much gotten lost. It, it seems that now in the church world we are looking for the second rather than living in Him. And that's what we're trying to emphasize here. We're not trying to uh, pick a fight with anybody. We're, we're you know, uh, we're simply trying to declare the truth as it is in Christ concerning our salvation. And, and again, that takes us to look at the first and the second, and that, that turns out to be a tremendous study uh, that would take up our time for a good time to come. So uh, we're just going to try to emphasize some things. Uh, we might also today, uh, uh, as far as bringing the first to its end, talk about the end of the world. Uh, I remember uh, when I was living in Denton, Texas. Now, this, is, this has been a long time ago. I don't know how long ago, 30 years ago. It's been a long time ago. And uh, I went into a particular barber shop uh, on a regular basis. The lady that ran it was both a beautician and a barber. And both my wife and I uh, frequented that place. And so I went in one time, and, 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 and uh, uh, Janie wasn't uh, with me. And this was actually not in Denton. This was here in Marshall, Arkansas, not that many years ago. And so I sat down there, and there was, of course, the lady was there, and she had five or six uh, older ladies. Uh, I happened to get there on on Saturday, and that was the day that all of the older ladies, in fact, they would come from the convalescent home, came to get their their hairdo for the weekend. 
So I was, so she put me in, so she knew the other was going to take her a while. And I was sitting there, wishing that, <laughs> that I wasn't there, and because they were talking about uh, religious stuff, and they were talking about the end of the world. And they were bringing up all of these things that were taking place, and uh, things that weren't like they used to be, and, and, and they were all signs of the end of the world. And I simply sat there with my arms folded and just hoping, you know, for her to hurry with my hair. And, uh, but instead of doing that, she said, well, we have a preacher with us today, and let's just ask him. And so she said, J.W., uh, when is the end of the world? <laughs> and I, I just, uh, I said, well, do you want a scriptural answer? Or, you know, this come some kind of a speculation? And, and boy, the conversation stopped and the, Ladies all got interested, and she said, well, uh, scriptural. And I said, okay, scripturally, the world as spoken of in the Bible. Now, scripturally, the world ended about 2,000 years ago. And I mean, you, you could hear rollers popping. I mean, you know, no one had not, there wasn't a question. There was nothing. The lady that was cutting my hair didn't have any idea what to say. So she just went on and cut my hair. Those ladies never opened their mouth <laughs> again as long as I was sitting there. And I was kind of disappointed. <laughs> I, I was kind of disappointed because I thought, well, that ought to bring about a, something, you know, some question. Nothing. I mean, it was dead dog silent. And so she finished my haircut, and I paid her, and I left. So I'll never forget that. But in reality, hon, that's exactly according to the Scripture. This, this world that we're looking to come to an end, and, and uh, the world will come to its end, and Christ will come and take us to another world or bring us into a, another realm of some kind. Uh, that world has already come and gone. And... We may, in the course of our conversation, we may, we may look at that because, because much of Christian religion, I mean, you, you can see it on television, people talking, and they're not, they're not even Christians, but they have got that much out of Christian religion that, you know, they'll, they're still looking for the uh, apocalypse. Uh, they're still looking for the end of the world, even though some of them that are saying that, uh, and the movies that are made, don't even recognize Christ as, 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 you know, as being anything, really. And yet, they're looking for the end of the world. And they blame it on the Bible, you know, and the teachings of the Bible and all of that. But even, when, even where that is, is among Christians, they associate the end of the world with the coming of Christ. And in one of these sessions, uh, uh, Raven and I were talking, in one of these sessions we may just look at that term coming. They, it will really surprise you to see what the Scripture actually is talking about where it is using 
the word coming in relation to Christ himself. Uh, that'll take a, probably a whole session to really look at those scripture. And, but I'll tell you this, it's not related to the end of the world. Because when we say that, end, when most people say end of the world, then they're looking, they're talking about this planet. Uh, mankind and, and, and this planet. What I was talking about was the cross where, where everything of the first everything of the first which we may talk a little about came to its end with the cross. Everything. The end of the world came. The scriptures speak of that. And it is true there that the translation of the word, or the, the word world there is translated from the Greek word age, the end of the age, which has nothing to do with the planet at all, uh, as far as the planet being destroyed somehow. Uh, it is talking about, it doesn't even have to do with, with all humanity being wiped out. It has to do with the first coming to its end and the second coming forth in reality. Because, hon, the scripture speaks of our salvation. And, and I just want to read a few paragraphs to get us started. That's usually the way we do. And then we'll look at Scripture. Uh, because to look at this thing, you have to start back. And, and we're not going to spend that much time today doing it. But I thought it might, uh, because we'll look at maybe the terms first and second uh, as, they, as they relate to you and I, as they relate to Christ, as they relate to our salvation. Uh, having to do with a pattern set forth in the Scripture. A pattern. Uh, this paragraph, it's the same with the tabernacle with regard to a pattern. That's why the Lord said, be very careful. Now, I'm those are my words here, but uh, be very careful that you do it according to the pattern, that all things be done according to the pattern. In Exodus 25, verse 9, why? Why would God tell Moses that as he was laying out the tabernacle, uh, laying out, actually, uh, laying out a covenant on Mount Sinai, uh, laying out the whole of his dealings with Israel, not just how to build a tabernacle, but that had to do, uh, it had to do with the sacrifices, had to do with the priesthood, had to do with everything of Israel at that particular time. And uh, because Moses didn't know what he was doing, nor did any of the people who worked on the various parts of the tabernacle. They didn't have the slightest idea of what they were doing. God simply gave them the ability to do it. There, however, was a mystery hidden in what they did that was to be revealed in Christ. So what they did had great significance. It had great purpose. But the purpose was not found in the things they did. What they did had great significance because it all pointed to Christ. It would find its purpose and significance in Him. It also made necessary His coming, His appearing. It made necessary His coming because in that all of those things testified of Him, nothing other than Him, nothing less than Him, would give them purpose or significance. 
what were they what were they a testimony of the priesthood all of it except the person of our salvation and I, it goes on here this is a good place to tell you that our salvation is bound up and in a person our salvation in fact is a person now hunt I'm reading this because when we start talking about a coming of Christ it's very to me it is essential that we understand something of what we're talking about because in the first order of things which that tabernacle was part of it everything testifying every sacrifice every piece of furniture all of it had to be fulfilled in a person and if we're going to say that that person has not yet come then we wipe out most most everything that is given of God concerning him in his testimony which which is the whole of the of the scripture that that was then the Old Testament the Old Testament our very life is bound up with a person and we've been brought through salvation into a person the old covenant speaks of him the new covenant is him does not speak of him also although that's the way most or many ministries today preach it many say that the old covenant speaks of him but the new covenant speaks of him better or speaks of him clearer but it doesn't the new covenant is not another testament of his coming the new covenant is in fact in he himself the new covenant is christ it's not another list of things about him another list of types and shadows promises and prophecies that's not what the second is the second is he himself and the all things of the second all things are found in him as related directly to him in the old the first order of things under the old covenant there was a natural city called Jerusalem but in the second we have a spiritual city called new jerusalem where is it it's in him if it's part of the testimony it has got to be part of the fulfillment if it's not part of the fulfillment and you need to go back and check it out in the testimony now the testimony is either fulfilled in him or it isn't but since the testimony given of God in the scripture of which Jesus speaks they are they which testify of me so the testimony is either fulfilled in him or it's not but since the testimony is a testimony of a person why shouldn't that testimony be fulfilled in the person himself since every part of this testimony was a testimony of him not something the whole testimony of the scripture comes to be fulfilled in him the problem with christians today in many cases on is that we just really don't 
comprehend the fullness of Him. We're not seeking for the reality of all things in Him. We're not having Him as the reality of all things in us. And therefore, our comprehension of salvation is either based on things or a few things, or it's just a very small comprehension of Him to begin with. All I'm showing you here is that the very order of Scripture, first and second, the very order of the covenant, first and second, necessitates His appearing. Now one more paragraph. So when we speak of the first and second biblically, it must be related to either all of those things under the Old Covenant or the fulfillment of the New Covenant. It has to be related to either the Old Order or the New Order. And if we can just get a hold of that, it will solve for you and for me the first and second coming. First and second appearing. First and second everything. You see, we want to come over here in the second and have another first and second coming I'm talking about. We want to come over in what is actually the second that was prophesied of, promised, in types and shadows and all of that, in the first, I'm just going to say the first order of things, set forth in the Scripture as a testament. That includes all the feast of the Lord, includes everything that is there. And we want to come over into the second and create another first and another second. And that's not biblically correct. It's not Bible order. We're going to be dealing with a great deal with having to do with order. Well, probably not today. First and second to their proper definitions. First covenant, second covenant. And that's what is being talked about in Hebrews 9 and in Hebrews 10. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, Hebrews 10, verse 5 through 10, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. And of course, that's the body of his death, his flesh body. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, thou hadst no pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will, I come to do thy will, O God, by the which will. Now, what is the will? To take away the first and the second. By the which will, by taking away the first and establishing the second. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He deals with the first and the second by the cross. You'll find this again in 1 Corinthians 15 where he says, the first man is after the earth earthy, but the second man is the Lord from heaven. As we have borne the image of the earth, 
earthy, so must we bear the image of the heavenly. In that text, in that text, it says, if we read the whole, that the first is not spiritual, but the second is spiritual. Now, even here in the first order of things, under the old covenant, you understand that the whole first order given of God by covenant, a covenant that can only be fulfilled in Christ, that is made new. How does he make that covenant new? And I said here he takes all the time out of it. It's not time oriented now. The new covenant shall never end. It is eternal even as he is. It is new as to divine nature and character. It is new because it is not based upon types and shadows or people or places or things. It is new as to its substance, which is nothing other than Christ himself. In his death he takes away the first that in his life, in himself, he may establish the new. Yeah. The first and the second is just replete throughout Hebrews. All the way through. Uh, Hebrews 11 says this, By faith we know that the worlds were created uh, by the word of God. And, uh, you know, by, by uh, so that the things that are seen were created by that which is unseen. Meaning that the unseen things are more substantial in their nature than the, than the seen things. So my point in that is we think the worlds that were created is the planet he's talking about, but that word yeah. is age. Yes, it is. The age of testimony was created by faith. So the whole thing was originated in and premised upon something unseen, something eternal. But he brought into the realm of sight and sound a testimony uh, a shadow, which is basically cast by a person or a, an object, and he cast that shadow in the earth to testify of the body that cast it. 
and uh, the person that cast it. So with that, with that whole thought, you go to this first vessel, which is that shadow, which yeah. is that testimony, and it said it was flawed in the hands of the potter. And I looked at it with the testimony being that it was flawed for a purpose. It was, it was like an intentional flaw that he put in the person. Yeah, exactly. And this is the whole fault that he found throughout that whole testimony. There was an underlying issue, and, and I, I like uh, James and Paulson Brown, they say, with the word faultless, perfect in all of its parts, so as not to be found at fault with or wanting anything which ought to be there, answering all the purposes of the law. The answer, in, the law in its morality is blameless, this external thing, but in the saving of us, it was defective, and so it was not faultless. And I like the yeah. way they present that because that's what it's showing. There was a in the hands of the potter was a flawed vessel, but he created it. Yeah, he did. And so then we see him take that vessel, and and it says in in the King James it would say he made it again another. You look at it in the original, and it says he made an altogether other, other than that, vessel, as it pleased him. So now you bring in the pleasure of God, but only in reference to the second. You have the pleasure of the potter realized, I come to do thy will. Yeah. You have the pleasure of the potter now fully realized in this second vessel, because here's the intention of the potter fully met. And I see that same thing. So when he takes away the first, establishes the second, he's taking away that vessel that had no, had a flaw. And he bring it's, it's just like what I've been looking at with Romans 8 and, and 4. That what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his son made under the law with the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh, took that away so that the righteousness of the law could be fulfilled in us. To me, I see that same thing being presented there. That he brings in, he doesn't make that one over again, try again. Right. He brings in something totally different. Something what? First the natural, then the spiritual, or afterwards the spiritual. And I think that's what we're talking about. And, and the reason that most people are still even though born again, even though in the second, looking for something that one day will happen is because they, they, they fail to realize the differing natures of the first and the second. One's natural, one's spirit. One is seen, one is unseen. I mean, with natural. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's a big part of the dynamic why there's such a misunderstanding why people are still waiting on something when they're in the very thing they're waiting on. Yeah. You know? And you're, you're, you're right. Somewhere in this manual, I ran into that, to that very thing that you're talking about, yeah. but that's exactly because how many even, they look at the, that <laughs> parable concerning the potter and the wheel, and they don't really know what to do with it. Right. You know, sometimes they'll just make it a sinner. Well, you, and, and the, even if they apply it to Israel, they think, oh, God gave them a second chance. That's what they're talking about. Exactly right. So he took the flaw out, and he's given them a second shot. No, it's a whole together different Israel. It, it, Israel is my son. I mean, it's, yeah. here's the best one. that pleases me. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There's the vessel that, that is, is referring to. Yeah. It is the vessel, and that, you know, that that's a, that is a tremendous, uh, not that all aren't, but that is a tremendous pattern of what we're sitting here, uh, you said what we're, what we're sitting here talking about. Uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we could look at as well then. Uh, 
in Ephesians, and we've looked at this, but hun- what I was thinking about this yesterday, and, 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 and uh, because when I said a while ago that we're not just jumping on the doctrine second advent, what we're trying to do here is look at the Scripture and see the reality fulfilled in Christ. Uh, there is no <laughs> there is no second advent, and so I I was thinking about uh, Raven when Paul uh, found in First uh, Corinthians fifteen. And I remember looking at that, and he's talking about resurrection. But he's not talking about resurrection as a doctrine, or, you know, he's not arguing with them about different kinds of resurrection, or uh, about what some believe about it, and others believe about it, and this and that. He, he's So, what he's doing there is presenting Christ himself, uh, you know, as the resurrection of the dead. And he's, in doing that, he's showing that everything in the Scripture, and this is when he talks then again, another place in, in, the, in, in, in the book of Acts, where he's talking to uh, boy, King Agrippa, uh, and he's, he's saying, uh, Oh, King, I'm not preaching anything that their scriptures does not declare. Moses, and the prophet. Moses yeah, I'm, I'm not presenting something new here. And he wasn't there, and he never did. He was presenting the promise of resurrection in the person of Christ Himself. And it, it seems too simple for a lot of folks, seemingly, in, in, that Jesus told to a little, just a little insignificant uh, handmaiden uh, there at her own house uh, after her brother died with Mary and Martha, and He said, I am the resurrection, and the life. And that's what he's presenting in 1 Corinthians 15, is the transition that the resurrection, not being an event, but a person, exactly the man, the second man, has brought in from the first to the second. That's what the resurrection accomplished. Exactly. That's Hebrews 10. Take away the first, establish the second. The word established means to make to stand erect. Yeah. Who do we think that is? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like he's just working on it with a hammer and chisel. No, he is that second in its full establishment. The one God raised. Yeah, I was going to say the word erect is yeah. resurrection. That's it. And and that's and 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 that's true. And I. Uh, so it's 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 the same thing here about you know the taking away it. So we so we say that everything in the testimony is fulfilled in the person, and I know that when people hear that, because it's easy to do that, that. People will agree with that, but they think what we're saying, and they think that what Christ is saying is that He will do all those things. Yeah. You know, all those things are something that He will do when, when in actuality and truly set forth in the Scripture, He sums up all of those things in himself in himself so that's that's what I'm just going to read here and we'll we'll go on with it but uh, let's look at what we have read in Ephesians 1 9 through 10 having made known unto us the mystery of his will 
his will, uh, his will, in which he hath which he hath purposed in himself, which was a mystery. Of course, it is a mystery no longer, but it was a mystery. Here is the will that in the administration of the fullness of times, here the second will be seen as the administration of the fullness of time or times. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, made under the law. Which one of these relates to time? The first order, the first that we're talking about, first and second. All we're doing right now is just showing in the Scripture these two terms, first and second. And none of them refer, when the one is referring, with referring to the second, none of that is referring to what Jesus will do, but to who He is. Who He is. He came as the end of the first, and He came as the substance and person of the second. I think we heard ourselves too. When we, you know, we'll take something like that. We'll take Hebrews 10. And we'll say, okay, what that means now for us is it's a process of elimination. And what I mean by that is we're saying, so he is doing that here. He's taking away the first, establishing the second. I mean, we, you can't say that and know where you are and know the reality in which you now dwell, know the reality that dwells in you. This is something done once and for all. How, I mean, because he just said, he'll go on, as you read a while ago, by which will we are sanctified. Yeah. By one offering, once and for all. That means separated fully from something, brought into something else. All done. That means when, when we are born of God, we are brought into something. What is that? It's the second. That which is spiritual. That which is faultless, as we said just a second ago. And, and it, it's amazing to me. The thing that means that what faultless there means we, we just seem to read over the first was with fault meaning deficient defective but the second the reason it was sought after is because God wasn't seeking after something he still had to fix he was seeking after something that was perfect in its nature that had no defect whatsoever and that's who now presently lives in us. And the whole point is, now we must see the one who lives in us. Not make it a, 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 a dispensationalized process, but realize that the first and the I mean, uh, the, 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 the one who is the end of this and the establishment of this is one and the same. And when he comes to dwell in us, that has come. You know what I'm saying? So it's the understanding of who is present that now brings us to a greater apprehension and comprehension of salvation. Not this, I don't know, this linear uh, thing that continues on forever and never ending. It, to me, that's just like, you know, one day it's going to happen. Yeah. No. If, if, you, if you are in the resurrection himself, then th this is so. This is so. It's, it's not something that will be so. Uh, not, not eschatologically or inwardly. No. No, not really. It isn't. And that's the, the thing of seeing him as he is. And 
you know, regardless of the effect that that has on my soul and on my heart, the point is we're not seeing him as he will be. We're not seeing him as he ought to be. And we're not seeing him as one day he will be. Uh, I think we're still very much bound up in a time ordered thing and that's that's it would that's what I'm talking about when uh, the end of the end of the times he is the fullness of the time he didn't just he did away with it in that he fulfilled it himself I mean everything that the times of Israel spoke of yeah. all of their feasts all of their uh, all of that, everything was time ordered. I mean, when God first started to deal with Israel uh, under Moses, he, he said, this is the beginning of months for you. So he created those, those times, actually, that didn't exist before. Uh, he created the Feast of Passover. He created the Feast of Tabernacles. He created, he created all of that. Uh, and consequently made times out of them because of the condition of Israel. Uh, and he gave them days and he gave them times and he gave them Sabbaths. And, and, and yet, see, Christ doesn't come and, and, and work out a Sabbath for them. And he's the Sabbath. Uh, and just like he is the answer to all of that. And, and that's what we're, when we read here, uh, the administration of the fullness uh, of times. Uh, and, and then uh, where he uh, is spoken of again in, in, in Galatians, because Paul writing to the Galatians is talking about actually those same, those same things. He's talking about the law and the feast and all that there, you know, the circumcisions on the eighth day and all of that. Uh, and he says, when the fullness of the time. And that pretty much, in my mind, gathers up all of the times, the whole thing that, the whole thing that, that God instituted himself. Well, the fullness of it came. The fullness of it came. He sent forth his son. Uh, and then it connects it directly to the cross, made of a woman, made under the law, uh, to redeem, and he had to do that at the cross. Uh, so, uh, we look at the Scripture, if we can divide the Scripture with the first and second, uh, the old and the new, whatever, then we have in the Scripture the testimony of him given of God, and then we have in the Scripture the direct answer to all of that testimony. And, and, and it, we could go ahead and gather up into that testimony. I mean, things like the city, uh, and, and on and on and on, all that, all that was part of it, because the answer to it is not, see, not another testimony of one, but one who sums up in himself, one who in the, in the new covenant, one who appears and says, I am, I am all of this. And uh, here in the scripture that we read, the dispensation of the fullness of times. Here the second is the dispensation or the administration of the fullness of time. For when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, and, and, and I've quoted that already. Uh, the first order is time-related. Where do you find the type of days? In the second? No. You find it in the first. You find the order of six days, you find the order of the seventh day, you in, in the seventh day Sabbath. Where do you find that? In the first. 
because it's time related. And I guess this is talked about here because it seems like with, with the church world today, everything is still time related. And that's something of what you were saying a while ago. It's still time related. One day, one day, looking for the day of the Lord, uh, you know, and looking for it everywhere except in the Lord. You were looking for it in time related things. So we're still looking to the time that God will do this and God will do that and our whole, so much of, maybe not the whole, but so much of the Christian religion is based upon that same time-related thing. It, it, it's almost like Jesus never came. And, and, and so, well, no, he did, but that was his first coming. Honey, that's his only coming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that same Jesus now lives in you. But that's not, that is, if we want to call a second advent, then look at it on the day of Pentecost, but I can't even call that a second advent. That's Jesus doing what he said he would do. I'll come again. I'll come anew. I'll come in newness. That's when the second came to dwell in us. And as far as time, as far as this earth is concerned, and as far as things that are seen and can be seen and touched and all of that is concerned, there, there's not another coming. Yeah, uh, and here's the deal. Everything that he calls a shadow throughout his letters or the letters that you read, everything he calls that were visible, tangible, real things, if we call it real. Yeah. That you could touch, taste, and everything. I mean, it was visibly observable. I mean, every indication would be that's real. But it was a shadow of the real thing. Yes. The real thing was the spirit, was what couldn't be observed in the way those things could be. Man, that is so far above our heads to even grasp that. And that's why people are still floating around waiting on something. Well, because to them, for it to be the fulfillment, it has to be more, almost more visibly apparent than the other, meaning with big explosions happening. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, so I don't know. But you're still looking at it with human eyes, and you're still reasoning it out in a human mind. Mm -hmm. I don't care how big it gets. The, the coming of the second, the person of the second, was the coming into my soul of the, how does he say it in, in chapter 10, the very image of the thing. Yeah very substance of the things that the shadow is going to be. Amen. Yeah. Well, is not that that we're talking about here the mystery that was hidden? Mm -hmm. yeah, Christ in you. That's yeah, is the, is the answer to that, but that was the mystery that was hidden in all of those things. You know, and and then when he stood on earth in their midst, mystery was still hidden. Yeah. They couldn't see him with flesh and blood. Although there he was. Well, We're at the end of this session, I think, folks. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 is what Rabin was talking about a while ago. The Hebrew writer says, Time past hath in time past spoken, but now at the end of those days spoken in son. And...
here is the administration of the fullness of time. That is the administration of the Spirit. Here time has come to its fullness. It can't go any farther. It is no more so far as being significant is concerned. It is filled up. It is finished. Its purpose has come. The purpose of days has come. The purpose of feast has come. The purpose of years and the order of years has come. Time has come to its fulfillment in Him, in the second, which is not measured by time, nor is it related to time. It is eternal, which does not mean a long time, but eternal as no time. Here in the first, we have a long time. In the second, we have no time. In the second, weeks, days have no significance. Our Christians are bound up to weekdays, weekend days. They have spiritual, and, and, and they actually have no spiritual significance. Now, in saying that, we're not talking about we ought to quit having services on Sunday. We have services <coughs> because we don't have to work. <laughs> you, you can do it any day you want. You can do it any day you want to do it. But, but to make those days of spiritual significance... And, and, you know, I say that, I say it carefully, because we don't know who all hears this. It goes around the world. So we're not, we're, we're not saying you ought not to gather together on Sunday, but I'm saying you ought not to fail to gather together any time. Uh, and all of that, it, it's that we have, what we have done, we have made, Days and times spiritually significant, like unto the first. And in the second, days and times are not spiritually significant. Because they're fulfilled in the second. They're fulfilled in Him. In, in, in Him. Let no man judge you with respect to holy days and meats and drinks. I mean, it's, got, it's the same thing. Yeah. The day is explicitly for His appearing. Well, He's the reality of it, folks. Where do you think the day that He is, where do you think that day is? It is found only in Him. Life and light. So we walk in the light as He is in the light. And as He is eternal life, He is eternal light as well. So we're not looking for another day any more than we're looking for another salvation. For Christ is the person. And as Rabin has said several times, he is the indwelling person of our salvation. And we're out of time, but right now we would probably take another session and look at the word come or coming in the light of that day in the light of Christ. What is the coming of the Lord all about? Uh, what do we mean? Uh, uh, 
in the Scriptures? What, what is it talking about in the usage of this word, of this word come? Because it's throughout the Scriptures, and most everyone that sees it looks at it in a future tense. I mean, you know, uh, can't see the Lord because the Lord hasn't come yet. But He has, and He lives in you. He lives in you. Well, we'll stop here. We will stop here with the first and the second. And, you know, we could probably say, and we do say, and have said before, you can really sum up everything of the first in one man, Adam. And you sum up everything of the second in one man, which is Christ. All right. We'll stop just now. We should be we should be stirring up some questions along the line here, and we we invite you to send your questions to us, or some sharing, or something that you are seeing of the Lord. We'd love to hear from you, and and if you have something that you're concerned about or questions about, we'll be glad to deal with them here during this time of the open forum deal with you about them personally. So the whole session here is designed to relate to you, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and give you an open door to relate to us. The Lord bless. It's been good to be with you during this time. Look forward to seeing you again. Amen.